I'd like to welcome to the main stage Stephanie Flanders, Head of Economics and Government at Bloomberg Editorial and Research, and her panelists. His Excellency, the Minister of Economy, Trade and Industry and Deputy Chief Cabinet Secretary of Jama Japan, excuse me, Yasutoshi Nishimura, and His Excellency, the Senior Minister of Singapore, Tharman Shanmugaratnam. <laughs> We are living in the middle of a pretty fundamental multiple regime shift. If you think about energy prices, food prices, interest rates, inflation, the geopolitical map of Europe, even the number of major crypto platforms, all of those things have changed radically even since we last met here in Singapore. And I think that that world of multiple crises has left enormous room, we've already seen, for, for uh, businesses and investors to make big mistakes. We saw recently in the UK, previously unimaginable scope for policymakers to make mistakes. Um, we have, for this opening set, one of the opening sessions this morning, two senior ministers who have yet to make such heroic errors um, in their policy making. Uh, they are in particularly interesting spots, vantage points in the global economy to watch this period unfold and also intervene with, with wise policy and analysis. So I'm delighted that you're both here. We're going to open with a couple of opening statements. Uh, Minister Nishimura will begin in English, but then you will need your your translator headsets. Um, Minister, I will begin with you. Uh, the world that I've painted, this very different global economy, uh, do you, do you recognize that world and, and how should policymakers in Japan and elsewhere respond? Thank you. Uh, the, the, good morning, this green, uh, I speak English, uh, uh, the first presentation. So, good morning, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for inviting me this, uh, here today. Uh, I'm Nishimura Yasutoshi, Minister, uh, uh, Minister of uh, Trade and uh, Economy and Trade and Industry. And uh, first of all, Singapore is a, a very memorable place for me. As I visited here in 1995 for my honeymoon, we stayed at uh, Ruffles Hotel, so my wife was so, so glad. But oh, then we went to Malaysia, uh, where we put on helmet and visited the Panasonic factory. And so my wife still said to me uh, every time, uh, why did we have to wear helmets on our honeymoon to inspect the factory? <laughs> For decades. Japan has been building broad supply chain in this area and growing together with partners in the Asia region. We will continue to develop a win-win relationship in the Indo-Pacific region, overcome the crisis, crises we are facing now, and open up the future for growth and pro prosperity. The world is facing three major historical crises, the COVID-19 pandemic and the aggression against Ukraine, and climate change. In the midst of three crises, the world is being pushed forward the divergence. However, in times like this, cooperation is important, not decoupling. I will always keep in mind the free and open in the Pacific, FOIP, advocated by former Prime Minister Abe, who fell victim to a deadly bread in July. I intend to carry forward former Prime Minister Abe's will and uh, promote the establishment of a free and uh, inclusive economic order. Looking around the world, we, will dis we see disruption and conflict in various supply chains for semiconductors, pharmaceuticals, LNG, and other goods. Japan would like to build a cooperative relationship with like-minded economies in the Indo-Pacific 
to overcome the current challenges. Taking semiconductors as an example, the Japanese government is boldly providing about 9.2 billion US dollars in semiconductor capital investment and R&D, including 4.4 billion US dollars to support investment by companies from like-minded economies, such as uh, TSMC, Micron, and Western Digital. We are also supporting development of next generation semiconductors such as Beyond 2 Nanos, which holds the key the to the future digitalization and green technology. And as Sony's investment in a semiconductor plant in Thailand shows we hope to keep building and strengthening supply chains in Asia while taking the lead in cutting-edge technologies of the future. It is also important to promote rulemaking for international trade. When I was a minister in charge of the TPP, I carried the CPTPP commission to launch the uh, accession process for the United Kingdom. Although I continue to believe that it is desirable for the United States to return to the TPP, the IPF has a lot of significant significance as a, a pro, uh, practical approach that strengthens strength U.S. involvement in the region. Japan is willing to act as a bridge between the United States and the Asian, con Asian countries so that the IPF will be an inclusive framework and begin to deliver tangible benefits soon. Next, turning to the energy sector, we can no longer delay responding to climate change. Countries share the goals of achieving carbon neutrality while at the same time ensuring a stable energy supply. However, we must understand that different countries have different pathways to achieve this goal. Japan possesses technologies such as hydrogen, ammonia, co-firing, and CCUS. While utilizing the, these advanced technologies, will cooperate with countries based on their, their individual needs and to contribute to diversified and realistic energy transitions, taking consideration of each country's circumstances. This is our vision as established in the Asia Zero Emissions Community concept. We have allocated 1 trillion yen or 7.1 billion US dollars in the supplementary budget to promote green transformation. From the Middle East, where there is an interest in the production of green ammonia, green hydrogen, to all over Asia to meet the large demand for such products, we will promote the construction of the vast supply chain in the Indo-Pacific region. For this purpose, we will finance, financially support advanced demonstration projects across the region. Startups at the core of creating new ideas and technologies. Open innovation with startups will provide a major stimulus to Japan's large companies. Japan, Japan's large companies have finally begun to review their investment strategies as well as their payroll and personnel systems. We'd like to strongly encourage these companies to change through open innovation and their manners uh, as a means. In order to promote such bold restructuring, we expand the size of fund allowed for JIC, uh, Japan Sovereign Wealth Fund, to 1.1 trillion yen, or about 7.8 billion US dollars. Their uh, supplementary budget includes 20 billion yen, about uh, one 143 million US dollars for investment in startups through collaboration with overseas funds. We hope to make effective use of this budget as soon as it's passed. Next year will be the 50th year of Asian, Asian, uh, ASEAN Japan Friendship and Cooperation. The Prime Minister Kishida announced over one week, uh, over the weekend, that uh, he plans to hold a commemorative summit in Japan in December next year and present a, a new vision 
for ASEAN Japan cooperative relations. I look forward to working with friends in the region or to overcome the major crises we face by working together to solve the challenges through innovation, building a free and inclusive economic order, strengthening supply chains, and transitioning to clean energy. Next year, as the chair of the G7, Japan will take the lead in this discussion to contribute to building prosperity in this region and across the world. Thank you very much. Senior Minister uh, Tawan, we got all those forecasts wrong. I guess I ask you the same broad question. Did we just get our forecasts wrong, or is there a fundamental change, an underlying change in the structure of the global economy going on? There is a fundamental change, uh, and I think it requires that we uh, look at the issues through a lens that is not driven by forecasts, but by an appreciation of risk and uncertainty, except that the world is uncertain. The central banks misread the signs, or I should say, bet on the wrong side of that range of possibilities a year ago. They misread the risk of persistent and much higher inflation. And the price we now have to play, pay for that is a recession, the price you have to pay for now accepting that there's a serious risk of persistent inflation and stubborn inflationary expectations is you have to go through a recession. That's the price we pay. But fundamentally, it means that whether it's in central banking or other areas of economic policy making or corporate decision making, that we have to look at the world fundamentally through the lens of uncertainty, accept that things may pan out very differently from what we hope for, and don't just bet on the upside. Don't bet on what we hope to see. Anticipate what can go wrong, prepare for it, try to prevent things from going wrong, and that means a different fundamental orientation. It means investing in advance, not waiting for crises to occur, but investing in advance. And I think our fundamental challenge, when you think about that multiplicity of risks that you talked about, that Mike Bloomberg talked about earlier. Our fundamental challenge is we have to invest at a higher level for a much longer period of time than we have been willing to do in the past. Whether it's in energy security, both in clean and dirty energy, in order to make the transition not too disruptive, invest in food security, invest in agricultural efficiency, invest in pandemic prevention and preparedness, and invest in potential growth. Potential growth in both the developing world and the advanced world. It requires a higher level of investment. And when you add up what is required, the scale of investment required, and I was very interested in listening to Nishimura-san's um, uh, description of Japan's plans and vision together with its partners, when you really add it all up, the energy transition, pandemic preparedness, potential growth, preventing a rollback in the developing world. The scale of investment required is one that can only be delivered through public-private partnerships at a level that has never been contemplated before. It's well beyond public purses. It's well beyond the capacity of governments or even multilateral initiative. It has to be a partnership. And this is an opportunity. I mean, this is, in a sense, the way we build optimism, it is that new partnership between the public and private sectors where the public sector engages in lowering risk, both through better policy making, but also finding ways of participating in projects to lower risk in order to incite and encourage private investment. We're not going to achieve it otherwise. We just cannot achieve the scale of investment required for just climate transition alone, let alone all the other needs to raise potential growth without this new public-private partnership? Well, both of you have quite rightly looked to the, to the long term and thought about the long term vision. But as we know, 
those long-term plans and the ability to vest is also built on macroeconomic stability. So, Minister Ishimura, I have, I'm struck. One of the things that has not changed in the last year is the basic stance of Japanese macroeconomic policy, certainly the monetary policy. Um, the only thing that has really changed is the amount of intervention to support the yen. And we saw today an unexpected decline in the Japanese economy in part as a result of that weak yen. So, so can that policy continue? Are you concerned about the impacts on the Japanese economy that we saw in today's data? Uh, I'll speak uh, in Japanese, so please uh, put the headset, please. First of all, about the exchange rate, the foreign exchange rate, that is. As a member of the Japanese government, I'm going to refrain from making any comments. However, the yen is depreciating. That is a fact. And this is not desirable. What we want is stability. That is our basic stance. However, the US is raising its interest rates. So there is a gap between interest rates in US and Japan. Also, from the perspective of the trade balance, balance the yen continues to depreciate. That is my understanding. However, in order to overcome the current crises, innovation is going to be key. As you just mentioned, the private sector and the public sector have to work together and bring innovation to overcome the crises. At the time of the oil shock in the 70s, Japan doesn't have many resources. So we had the Sunshine Plan and the Moonlight Plan in order to put more efforts into R&D to create innovation. This was to bring new energy technologies. So the crisis gave birth to innovation. And in 1975, we had the Summit of World Leaders. So we brought this cooperative relationship, and that was born out of the crises as well. So for the current crises, willing nations, like-minded uh, nations, have to work together, and this momentum is growing. Innovation and partnership, this is going to be key to overcoming the crises. Of course, the foreign exchange rate, when it comes to that stability, is desirable, and there might come a situation where we have to raise interest rates, or uh, that the emerging uh, nations have to do that. So I think willing nations have to continue supporting the emerging nations. I am currently the Minister of Economy, Trade and Industry. So regarding the weak yen, my thinking is to use this as our advantage and increase exports. Also, TMSC, we are providing support for them to build a plant to Japan. So because of the weak yen, investing in Japan has never been easier. So we want to promote investment to Japan. Also, when it comes to which currency investors decide to buy, the decision is based on the future of each country. So that means that we need to reinforce growth of Japan as a country. Japan has been said to be a country of weak growth. However, we want to use this crisis to our advantage. And the government is going to be providing bold support to recover Japanese economic growth. But just very briefly, just to cl clarify what you said, it is true that a weak yen can be good for, for exporters, but not if there is a clear expectation that there will be a big change in policy 
in the, within the next 12 months. Do you, very briefly, do you accept that that uncertainty is making things difficult for, for Japanese business? Japanese economy will have the strong sense of urgency. So lost 20 years, lost 30 years, we discuss that about Japanese economy quite often. But during that period, we couldn't have the uh, renovation. And then businesses uh, try to push forward the changes that they couldn't do before. So pre-pandemic, compared with that, high level of investment and the capex is being done. And willingness to the investment is quite strong. So push forward the digitalization or promote the green transformation. So those movement is emerging, emerging. So the crisis uh, is to be transformed uh, to the power for the change. And for that, the government uh, has budgeted uh, for this coming year. Tamen, we've talked a lot. There's been a lot of talk about partnership and the importance of, of countries working together. But uh, the recent US trade policies and, for example, the attempts to uh, restrain exports of, of key semiconductors to uh, China, that surely it makes it difficult for an open economy in Asia to navigate and think about the future when the US appears to be trying to dri drive lines across the map. Well, I think, first, um, there is a way forward. We haven't reached the precipice yet, and there's a way of charting uh, a new cause uh, between the major powers as well as with the mid-sized powers and smaller nations like ourselves. It requires first, first and foremost stabilization. Just avoid dialing up the tensions, avoid further steps, avoid escalation that then becomes self-reinforcing. So that's the first order of business. Uh, but second, uh, there's so much common interest between the US and China and between all nations in the biggest challenges we face, climate change, pandemic preparedness, and just getting growth going. Those are the biggest challenges we face, which affect the well-being of our own populations. And focusing bilateral and multilateral efforts around those large challenges in a mission-driven way, tackle pandemic preparedness, create multivalent vaccines, tackle carbon capture, clean steel, clean cement, the whole range of innovations that are still out there, still at the boundaries of what's possible and not yet viable, but invest in it. There's a whole range of mutual of investments that are in the mutual interest that we have to collaborate on. And that itself forms, forms an overarching relationship between the major powers who will otherwise be obsessed with competition and obsessed with what divides them. Thirdly, there's also scope, I think, to all do some dialing down. Many small moves that could reduce tension. Um, I mean, if you look at, objectively speaking, if you look at much of the tariff war that has taken place, it's not been in anyone's interest. It's not in the interest of American workers, not in the interest of American manufacturing, not in the interest of China, not in the interest of Singapore and the smaller nations. So there's an opportunity to dial down in everyone's interest. So it requires that new understanding, and I think there's a very important new start yesterday in the meeting between the President um, Biden and President Xi, uh, there's an opportunity for a new understanding, but it then requires actions. Avoid further escalation, find ways to dial down, but also start exploiting this very large terrain of mutual interests that require collaborative investments, public and private, and using as best as we can the multilateral institutions. They are valuable institutions, particularly the World Bank and the MDBs. We are underusing them. By using them to catalyze private finance, we can actually go quite some distance to addressing that huge, that large-scale investment challenge that we have in the next 10 years. Well, we're going to uh, 
we might hear a little bit potentially of the dialing down. We have an opportunity for that anyway, because the US trade representative will be following. I'm tempted from what you've said to get you to do the interview. You might, uh, you might uh, get, get some, some global uh, progress out of it. But as you said, President Biden had, um, did have some, some warmer words after his meeting, and he suggested that there wasn't a new Cold War. And yet, it has become quite common for Biden administration officials to talk about wanting to prevent China to, from developing technologically in various areas. Do you think that's unhelpful? Well, I think first we, we have to recognize um, that uh, China is not the Soviet Union during the Cold War. China will continue to be a growing and emerging economy, and it will develop capabilities. You can slow the development of those capabilities, particularly in advanced semiconductors and a few other areas, but you can't prevent China from emerging as a major player in the global economy and in the global technology space. The question is whether you eventually want China as a formidable economy to be distrustful of you, to be in a relationship of antagonism, or whether you want interdependence. And that requires drawing careful lines around what is really required to protect national security, what is something you can allow to have continued exchange and interdependence on, but you watch and you verify some element of trust and verify, and what you have open competition on. It requires some clear lines and a clear framework that draws those lines. Uh, I believe it is possible. I, I don't think the US is set on a cause of collision with China, despite some of the noise you may hear. I believe it is possible uh, to formulate this framework and it is possible to then cooperate on the much larger challenges that both China and the US and the rest of the, uh, the, the multinational economy, the global econ the community, uh, faces. Minister Nishimura, do you think that the US is approaching this challenge of its relations with, with China in the right way? And particularly, uh, do you agree with the uh, semicon semiconductor chip restrictions? Uh, はい。えー、っとあのアメリカとは我々もコミュニケーションをあ、オッケー、ソーリー。Did we? あの我々、えー、アメリカとはあのコミュニケーションを非常によく取っております。Are in close communication with the states. 共有しながらですね、対応しているところ。We are sharing our thoughts and taking the appropriate responses. 一つは、えー、Few points I'd like to say. So first. The US and China have a dependency relationship in terms of the economy. Unlike Russia and Europe, when this interdependency becomes deeper, you can avoid conflict. And this is not true, as we have just seen. So economical interdependency exists. And how to manage this relationship so that it doesn't end up in a conflict is what is going to be important. Now, when it comes to economy security, I was the minister in charge of COVID-19, actually, and we had mask shortages, we had PPE shortages. No hand sanitizers. That is something which I experienced. So when a crisis occurs, we have to make sure that we can provide the critical goods. And for that, we need a supply chain with like-minded nations. We have passed a new law in Japan. And an important mission is to work on semiconductors and batteries. We, have, we want to make sure that we can provide this domestically and also work together with the will, willing nations so that we can have, have a supply chain to help each other out. So when US companies invest in Japan, 
a way through. So let, let me make the point uh, broadly. Um, no one can be naive about national security anywhere. And it requires some restrictions on economic activity, some components, some software, some investments. But there's another fundamental idea that we have to recognize, even from the point of view of national security, which is that an economically interdependent world and an economically interdependent US and China is also in the national security interest. And the way to recognize that is just, you know, just think very simply, just go through the thought experiment. Imagine a world where China and the US are decoupled in trade, investment, data, payments, financial systems, intellectual property creation. That would be a profoundly dangerous world. A profoundly dangerous world. So interdependence is not going to assure us of peace. There will be constant friction. The move towards a multipolar world was never going to be frictionless. But it's much safer than a world that's decoupled. So I would take that same attitude when we think about friend shoring and the like. Avoid decoupled alliances of friends as well. Go as much as we can for overlapping alliances. And whether it's the CPTPP or the RCEP or the other alliances that we are forming, keep them overlapping. And you'll notice that Singapore and several other Southeast Asian countries are in both sets of alliances. And we must keep it that way. We must grow it. Hold out the hope that both the China and the US are eventually going to be part of these trading alliances. Hold out that hope and leave the door open. Well, thank you to both of our ministers for, for an optimistic and forward-looking uh, initial session on this. I think we're going to be going over these, uh, these issues many times, but it's very good to start with a note of optimism. Thank you to both of you. Thank you. Thank you.